Hi everyone and welcome to day two of the AI Agents track. If you joined us yesterday, I hope you've learned a lot and found the talks useful. And if you're joining us today for the first time, a warm welcome. I have the great pleasure to be chairing this session. My name is Raluca Georgescu and I'm a research software engineer at Microsoft Research Cambridge. I'm part of the Game Intelligence Group, uh, where we focus on pushing the limits on reinforcement learning agents and modern video games. So today I have the pleasure of introducing our three speakers uh, who are going to be part of this session for the next roughly 90 minutes. First up, we have Junji Lee, a senior research engineer at Microsoft Research Asia. Next up, uh, we also have Wayne Yang, data scientist at Blizzard, whose work focuses on efficiently bringing machine learning into the game development stack. And last but definitely not least, we have Jacob Forster, uh, who's currently an associate professor at the University of Toronto and research scientist at Facebook AI. I'm super excited to hear from all of them. As we're getting ready, uh, we're going to go through each of the talks in turn, and then we'll have a live Q&A session with our speakers at the end of the talks. So if you have questions, please go ahead and post them uh, in the Q&A panel on the side. Also, if you like a question, please thumbs up uh, on it as we'll try and prioritize the most popular questions. Um, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can within the time we have. So without further ado, let's get on to the first of our three talks. Uh, Junji is on the Beijing time zone, so unfortunately he couldn't join us live today and won't be able to join the Q&A session afterwards. However, uh, we have his pre-recorded talk and I'm very excited to hear from him on their amazing progress uh, to get the first superhuman AI in the game of Mahjong. Hi everyone, this is Junjue from Microsoft Research. Today I'm going to talk about our Mahjong AI suffix. I will first briefly introduce Mahjong and our AI suffix. Then I will talk about more details on how we create a suffix. Mahjong is a very popular tile-based table game with over 90 million of players all over the world. Mahjong is so popular that many people feel that it is an easy game to play. In reality, Mahjong is an inter international math sport that is extremely difficult to master. On June 2019, Surface became the first AI to achieve 10 days on 10 whole platform, and it's the first time that a computer program outperforms most top human players in Mahjong. Tenho is the most famous Mahjong platform in Japan. After playing over 5,000 games in the Expo room, which is the only room AI is allowed to play in, Sufei successfully achieved 10 day, the highest level in that room. If we look at the stable ranking, which is an index provided by Tenho to evaluate the capability of Mahjong players, Sufei is much stronger than top human players. The average stable ranking of top human players is 7.4, while the stable ranking of Surface is 8.7. Please note that the stable ranking is not linear. For high ranks, the gap of 1.3 means a huge difference. Surface performance has been highly recognized by the best human players. For example, Asapin, who is widely recognized as a master of Mahjong in Japan, feels that Surface is even stronger than him. And Fudo Cornell, who is another famous player, Still, then he has stopped watching humans play after starting 300 games played by Sufex. In 2020, a book called Sufex Impact was published in Japan. Summarizing Sufex's novel style is a best-selling Mahjong tactic book written by one of the ma one of the highest-ranking players in Japan. There are also quite a lot of videos analyzing and studying Sufex's strategy by top human players on YouTube. We believe Surface is a good proof that AI learns from humans and can amplify human ingenuity. Why do we consider Mahjong an important milestone? On one hand, Mahjong is a very popular game, not only in Asia, but also all over the world, with over 90 million players in total. Even in the US, the National Mahjong League has over 500k members. On the other hand, Mahjong is a very difficult imperfect information game. The true difficulty lies in that one cannot see the private tiles of other players and cannot see the hidden tiles in the playing wall and the dead wall either. The permutations of these hidden tiles lead to a huge number of hidden states. 
if we compare games according to the number of hidden states, Mahjong is much more complicated than Go and Poker. Moreover, different permutations of these tiles mean the different levels of luck to players, and sometimes luck may dominate the result of the game. In this sense, Mahjong is closer to real-world applications like finance and logistics than other board games. For example, in finance market, the players won events also bring in uncertainty and luck to some people, and the other traders' strategy are part of the private hidden information. Due to these unique challenges, previously developed algorithms for Go and Poker will not work any longer, and we need new technologies. In the past several years, we have developed a novel system called Suffix. It is based on deep reinforcement learning plus cell play, and on top of that, global reward predictor, auto guiding, and policy adaption are the key technologies. This is the Suffix decision flow in Mahjong. We can see that the rules in Mahjong are complicated. During the game, the playing order is not fixed and can be easily interrupted by chopping, kong, or winning. Besides the complicated rules, Mahjong contains different kinds of information. For example, tile set, tile sequence, integer information, and categorical information. How can we design the state representation? so that our model can better understand the complex state and rules. To make our model better understand Mahjong state, we design channel-based features. It first encodes all observable information into multiple channels. Take the private hand tiles as an example. It uses four channels to represent these private hand tiles. Besides the observable information, we also do a short-term search and summarize as local features. This can help our network better doing score calculation and planning. We train a model with supervised learning by expert data from Tenho. The accuracy of our supervised learning model significantly outperforms existing work on margin action prediction. Suffix is first trained by supervised learning and then boosts through reinforcement learning. We build a highly parallel and scalable distributed reinforcement learning system, which can support up to 70 GPUs for parallel training, more than 2.5 million of cell play games per day. To ensure reproducibility, we also build scripts for job submission, resource allocation, model and log management. In Mahjong, there are both run scores and game rewards. Run score is determined by the winning hand of each round. Game reward is determined by the final rank of accumulated run scores. However, the game reward cannot differentiate between well played runs and poorly played runs, and the run score is not well aligned with the game reward. So, we design a reward predictor to provide immediate reward for each round, while optimizing for the long term game reward. The input of the reward predictor is the score information of current current runs, data information, and so on. The output is a final game reward. We use a two-layer GRU to train the reward predictor. The training signal for reinforcement learning is a marginal reward, which is the difference of predicted reward between the K and K-1 runs. Learning signal in Mahjong has large variance due to loss of hidden information. In order to make our training more efficient, we introduce Oracle Guiding. Oracle Guiding uses an Oracle agent that can see the perfect information to speed our training. The perfect information includes private tiles of other players and war tiles. It first uses all perfect information to save play, and gradually dropping out perfect information to the normal feature. After dropping out to normal feature, it continues training with one tenth of learning rate and rejects some stack action pairs if the importance ratio is larger than a threshold. With Oracle Guiding, we can achieve surface performance much faster. Based on previous works, we can start to update our model. It uses policy gradient with important sampling to handle the staleness of async training. We also introduce adaptive weight for entropy maximization to ensure stable exploration during long time of training. 
in Mahjong, different permutations of the hidden tiles actually correspond to totally different games. All we do during offline training is to find an AI model that can perform well on many different games. However, one size fits all is always very difficult. On the other hand, during the online playing stage, we are dealing with one specific game in which the permutation of the hidden tiles is fixed or invisible. In this case, the real state space swings a lot and it should be easier to adapt our AI model to fit this specific game. To do so, a straightforward way is to estimate the hidden tiles and adjust our policy on this basis. However, this approach is almost infeasible due to super high computational complexity. In Sufix, we take a very different approach. It adapts the offline train policy to a given initial hand as follows. First is simulation. We sample many permutations of initial wall tiles. Each permutation of wall tiles can ensure that my initial hand tiles are the same as real initial hand tiles. We use these wall tiles to sell play and get rewards. After simulations, we use the trajectories and rewards to fine tune the offline train policy. After adaption, we use the fine tune policy to play this round. By doing so, we can expect that the offline train policy can better adapt to current score and hand tiles. To demonstrate the value of each idle component in Sufix, we train several Mahjong agents. SLO is supervised learning model. Idle basically uses a run score as a reward. Idle 1 uses a reward predictor as a reward. Idle 2 further uses all guiding during reinforcement learning. From the figure, we can see that both global reward predictor and auto guiding can significantly improve the performance of our models. In addition to testing the enhancement of offline IRO training, we also tested the runtime policy adaption. The result shows that about 66% of initial hand gain improvement with policy adaption. Looking forward, we see a lot of opportunities for AI in the gaming industry. There are many material applications of AI in gaming. For example, in some games, there are many environments. Given a new environment, AI can help to predict not only the hardness, but also the popularity even before the environment release. AI can also be used to provide opponents or teammates their major press skill. Last but not least, AI can be a good tutor, just like Surface for Mahjong. For the biggest challenge, I think building AI with a high EQ is one of them. A good AI could be just like our best friend. It can play with us, feel our emotion, give us encouragement, learn new things, and group up with us. This is the AI that I'm really looking forward to. Thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to your questions. I'd like to thank Junji for his talk. It was great to find out all the details behind this amazing milestone. Now, I'm very happy to invite our next speaker, Wayne from Blizzard, who'll talk to us about their experience of moving from a scripted AI option in Hearthstone to a self-play reinforcement learning agent. Feel free to post your questions and we'll be addressing them with Wayne at the end of the talks. Wayne, take it. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Wayne. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about some work we've been doing with reinforcement learning in Hearthstone. So we started out with some background, um, just so we're all on the same page. Uh, if you haven't heard of Hearthstone, it is a digital collectible card game. Um, players, it, well now there are multiple modes, but the mode that I'm going to be talking about involves a player either constructing a deck or being provided a deck of cards, and the players using those cards to battle for control of the board and defeat their opponents. In particular, we want to look at the uh, kinds of scenarios and content that you can play in the Solo Adventures tab of, uh, of Hearthstone, uh, in which um, instead of playing against a human opponent, you're provided with an AI opponent. So the goals for uh, what we've been working on is trying to see how feasible it is to basically automatically produce a reasonable AI agent for eight players to face. Um, this is basically a form of automation in which we just want to replace the effort used um, 
to actually having to script that every time new content is created to get to the ultimate goal of a push button creation for uh, that system. So it's important to note here that the goal is not to produce a superhuman opponent, um, where projects that are sort of aiming to get to superhuman opponents are sort of taking challenges, environments, and games as benchmarks and milestones to test the limits and push the boundaries on what reinforcement learning and uh, machine learning can do. We want to sort of go in the reverse direction, which is to say, examine what insights and learnings have been uh, made out in the research world and at the bleeding edge and sort of bring them and adapt them to uh, an actual game production environment. So that's sort of the goal. We just want to make it automatic, but what gets in the way? So there, I think there are a couple ca main categories, the first of which is the problem challenges of the reinforcement learning problem itself, that um, if you take an arbitrary game in the wild and you sort of try to directly apply reinforcement learning, um, you know, you're going to run into some of the, some of the same types of challenges uh, all over the place, and this is definitely true of Hearthstone. Um, so the first one is uh, that there are many, many ways to play Hearthstone very, very poorly. Um, it's sort of like hard to imagine, sort of like looking at what random play looks like in Hearthstone is sort of like an alien experience of, if you think about bad play, it's often just sort of inefficient resource management where you don't quite use things very well, um, but what it really means is like active self-harm uh, for most of the policies that you could generate if you just randomly pick a function that maps states to actions. Um, and so really finding a reasonable agent is like a real needle in the haystack type problem. Um, the second challenge, and this is true for many games, uh, is that credit assignment for actions is delayed and sparse with win-loss as the only signal. So if you, if you just sort of take the naive, did I win or lose, as the only uh, indication of whether you're doing well, uh, you end up with very, very interesting dynamics. So in early experiments, um, we found that, you know, the only true common denominator of every win is that you took your cards and attacked your opponent's face and ignored everything else. Um, and so basically all we could get from the most naive approach was an agent that just clicked anything it could click and dragged it to the opponent's face. Um, there are, of course, complex and stochastic dynamics. Uh, many games have, uh, you know, lots and lots of different types of mechanics and synergistic and complicated interactions. Um, Harson is uh, is no exception there. So cards range from having just minions that cost X mana with Y attack and Z health to cards like this one, Yogg's Run, which is um, just complete madness and everything in between. Um, and then lastly, there is the challenge of hidden information. Um, because you can't see your opponent's hand, uh, there is a question of whether or not you should be considering, um, do they have certain cards that would be a strong counter to strategies that I might employ in a particular situation? Um, so we need to deal with that somehow. Um, and then finally, if we actually want to use something like this um, in a production setting, uh, one thing we don't want to do is have to retool the entire hardware stack for the server deployments. Um, and so we have some system constraints that the model must be pretty low latency on CPU. So we're probably not going to use, um, we're not going to be using like a deep, deep a CNN using rendered images from the clients or anything like this. We want to be using um, sort of as close to uh, what the game is like most readily able to produce in terms of game state representations. And also we want uh, for convenience purposes, a single model to cover all scenarios because we also don't want the system to make um, like CICD uh, really complicated and, and source control, um, uh, adding a lot of like complexity to managing source control for a large project. Okay, so that's sort of what's in the way. Um, next section here, I'm gonna talk about the approach we take to sort of overcome those and get to some sort of reasonable working AI. Okay, so the approach is fairly straightforward following the strategy of Alpha Zero. We're taking the, the making use of Monte Carlo tree search plus learning. Um, so in a nutshell, what this means is we fit uh, a model with two outputs. One is a policy and one is a value. So the policy indicating what should the agent do and the value network indicating uh, how good is a particular state. And the idea here is that during training, you have an initialized model that's sort of doing uh, random things and proposing random actions that aren't particularly good, but the usage of the Monte Carlo tree search or 
you know, insert favorite planning algorithm there, can use that output as a prior and then return back a policy which is actually better. Um, uh, and you get into a virtuous cycle where your neural network prior gets better so that the search is returning better actions for any given scenario. Uh, and there's a nice feedback loop there. Uh, we augment this with some auxiliary tasks, which I'll talk about later. Um, but what matters is that once we're done with training at runtime, we just do greedy action selection from the neural network. So rather than um, doing the MCTS uh, process on the server, we just use the learned um, prior model. So in some sense, you can think of it as the, just the gut instinct aspect of it. So there are some Hearthstone specific adaptations we need to make in order for um, this to work. It's not, we can't take things quite out of the box of MCTS for some of the reasons I mentioned um, in the challenges section, which is first of all, like we need to do something about the randomness. Um, this is mostly like a decision to be made. I don't know if there's necessarily uh, an obvious best answer here, um, but we, what we chose to do was determinize dynamics during search. So um, basically at the root of any particular search tree, we just have fixed the seed. Um, and so uh, you roll the same thing when you re 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 revisit nodes inside that tree. Um, this can lead to some sort of interesting quirks where it's like abusing the uh, RNG and playing things a little bit out of order, but on the whole, it seems good enough to provide reasonable training data. Um, secondly, for the model part of the uh, training component, the model is only given information visible to that player. So if it's searching from player one's perspective, the model predictions only have access to um, this, the information about their hand and the public information on the board. However, we do allow the tree search to cross and over into the opponent's turn. So during training, because uh, we're never actually, like we don't actually use the search during runtime, um, we just allow the tree search to cheat mildly. So it can cross over into the opponent's turn, look at the opponent's cards and say like, oh, it would be really, really nice if um, you, know, you played into this particular card, which allows that value to be back propagated into uh, the, the search tree route thus like sort of giving some kind of hidden information there. Um, and then the hope is basically over the course of training and over averaging over all the samples um, that will get to a point where, you know, 60% of the time you should be uh, attempting to just play out what you can. And so, or 40% of the time in the examples, like you should have avoided this particular scenario. Um, the other types of adaptations that we made beyond sort of like getting the algorithm to run basically is uh, we did inject a lot of domain knowledge into the training procedure uh, and i'll talk about that in a second um, in more detail we also used a custom model architecture to try to um, cut down a computation as well as reflect some inductive biases we have about how we might be constructing an ai and then finally um, we did add auxiliary tasks for some form of regularization um, one thing that we noticed is um, when we uh, don't add any kind of regularization task or auxiliary task. Uh, what what happened is that the learned representations for individual cards would sort of group by um, not necessarily what the cards do, but the context in which the card should be played. And um, this poses problems because that means what the cards represent, well, how the cards are represented is much more strongly tied to the sampling strategy used to generate data so that if two cards are played in similar context just by the chance uh, or just by the setup of what scenarios are being run in training, um, you may face generalization problems when it didn't accurately uh, group together cards that do similar things like do they are they do they act as a board clear or is there um, you know is it is it a board clear or is it just something that you play when your opponent has many minions in general and so um, the way we handle that is to basically take two consecutive states and try to predict the action in between. Um, so you may have seen something like that um, for uh, curiosity based reward training. We basically took a chunk of that to try and um, keep things uh, to map cards to their functional aspects. OK, so on the domain knowledge front, um, we want to make use of knowledge about Hearthstone instead of forcing an agent to learn Tabula Rasa, right? Like this has been, you know, this game has been out for a while. 
Uh, people have worked very hard and have learned thought really hard about how Hearthstone should work and how um, like aspects of Hearthstone that would be very valuable to uh, an AI agent. For example, there are already existing AI agents, so we can we like use some learnings about what is a good state, what is a bad state, how should we uh, organize the flow of data in sort of the model's compute graph um, to actually try and cut down on sample complexity and to ensure that um, the model can run as small as possible without having to take up a bunch of extra resources. So to this end, the first thing we have is a handcrafted heuristic. Um, so this is a little bit lucky because we can adapt. We were able to uh, have someone adapt this from previously existing work. Um, some of that work was related to cards like Zephyrus the Great here, which you can imagine might involve trying to understand how good any a given a state or board state in Hearthstone would be, um, as well as other aspects of, um, and you know, some manual tuning. And um, we use this in addition to the estimated value from the model. So what this means is when the tree search is being executed, we still use the neural network prior to sort of guide the, net, the search procedure to promising um, search paths uh, or paths through the tree. Um, but when we do the, estimation of how good a particular leaf node is, um, we are merging both the um, estimated value from the model as well as its handcrafted heuristic in order to be able um, to try and uh, back propagate that value. And then the last thing is, and the other part of the domain knowledge is the uh, model architecture. So this architecture that we chose is basically driven by domain knowledge in the sense that uh, what we're doing is trying to basically approximate the computation graph of the existing system. Um, one way that it manifests is you could think about actions in Hearthstone as always having a source object and a target object uh, if you look at the things on the board. So an action might be, for example, play the first card in your hand uh, and target the second enemy minion, right? And so in some sense, the the what you want to get to is to get an action score for each thing, we want to get an action representation by combining the representation of the source and the target. Um, and so then the, we try to encode this as a reasonable way for information to flow through this graph, but we, you know, we know that we that um, it's not quite that simple. There are a lot of dependencies on other aspects of the other objects available on the board. Um, and so we use uh, basically um, something that looks very much like a transformer with some modifications in terms of um, handing uh, there's some extra information being passed to the transformer, but long story short is um, our game state looks like a list of objects that are available on the board um, and their categorical numerical features. Those get pushed into, those get turned into fixed dimensional object representations. And then we pass those through um, an encoder, which is mostly, mostly a transformer. And this allows us to handle permutation variances Right, it's pretty unfortunate if you swap two cards in hand, uh, you end up with uh, different uh, logits for how good of, or how look like, different action scores. Um, that's pretty unfortunate. Okay, but right, so that's I mean basically the point is is look we know something about Hearthstone, we know something about the structure of the game, and we know how a system that has previously worked um, has been able to get uh, meaningful results. So I did want to call out that this. This triple strategy of like using the search, the heuristic, and the learning has important benefits. So the first of which is that by having this heuristic function, you get a baseline for performance for generated examples. Like you can just play with just the heuristic and the and a uniform prior, and then you get a good idea of, uh, you know, you could see that it does something reasonable. Um, this also gives us a very nice decoupling, um, which is that. Because we can just sort of play the heuristic alone, we, that can be debugged and tested separately from the full training apparatus. And while this doesn't give a full, um, uh, doesn't give you like the full picture of what the final model would do, um, it does give a sense of what the training data might look like. And if you can find egregious errors, that's helpful there. And then of course, because we can decouple that from the neural network, we can do the hyperparameter tuning uh, on just some set of offline data. Um, this is extremely helpful for ensuring that like we are able to make the most of a small, uh, like smaller sample sizes, um, as well as making sure that the sample sizes that we, the samples that we do get in that budget is um, at least as good as something that we can verify as, as useful. 
Okay, so the next section here is I did want to talk about some notes um, in terms of implementation considerations that come up more in the context of trying to bring reinforcement learning uh, to a game environment um, rather than sort of what you might expect in reinforcement learning research. The first of which is that the probability that you have a behavioral quirk in the final model is non-zero. That's true always, but in particular, if you have if you have to be training over many different scenarios, which you could imagine as many different environments, which are dis related but distinct, um, that probability is like closer to one. Um, and so, in a setting where you need to actually ship the thing, um, you need an escape hatch for fixing edge cases and undesirable quirks, uh, and hopefully a simple one at best, or like hopefully simple one and hopefully not particularly complicated to implement. And so one example, a triage procedure for what we're trying to do is would be uh, you basically, OK, check if the baseline search and the heuristic is misbehaving. Um, if it's uh, if you see some odd behaviors there, maybe you can just fix it there and then send it off for more training so that it gets picked up by the, the neural network itself. Or if it doesn't seem like it's an issue in the baseline search, um, check to see if it's uh, turn on the neural network with the search and see if there's a problem there. Uh, and then if it still looks fine, train for more data. If there's a, just a persistent problem that only appears um, at the model itself, then you know that's like the, the last resort of adding hard constraints for safety, um, action, like filters on actions and any sort of post-processing just to say, look, we know the model isn't picking this particular behavior up. Um, let's just like get rid of it. We might lose some cleverness in some situations, but it's much better than something looking very stupid. Um, in enough situations. Uh, the second implementation consideration I want to bring up is um, the way that we handled sort of integration with a reinforcement learning training apparatus is to have the game simulation in control of when to query the model. Um, and what this means is that the standalone, like the simulator is responsible for figuring out like how to spin up episode, like how to spin up an episode, how to tear things down when it's done. Um, like it takes in a configura configuration file to choose which ones, et cetera, et cetera. But at the point that it needs to make a decision or it needs an inference from the model, it just makes a remote request. Um, I mean, it could be implemented as a remote, we implement as a remote request, you could do it through shared memory or, or things like this, but what matters is that it's in control of uh, when to get the inference back. Um, so this means that like during search, we just need to tag the root nodes as this is data to keep and the internal uh, nodes of the, the search tree as just give me an inference back, don't worry about keeping this data. Um, what this means is that you can basically reduce the blast radius of changes you need to make in the code to get this kind of stuff to work. Um, if you just need to worry about, okay, how do I gather up a state into a serializable uh, message? And I jet, like I don't need to worry about acting as a server to the Python driver of the thing. The simulation acts as a client to some kind of inference server to be making decisions. Um, so this is nice in this particular case, but you can also imagine situations in which uh, you can actually, you might be able to embed this kind of thing in um, a more holistic AI system, which is using behavior trees and other systems where like there are some scripted behaviors that you must uh, or that you really, really want to keep because that's part of the vision, but there are certain aspects you want to learn um, using this kind of strategy makes it a little bit easier uh, on that front. The last implementation consideration um, that I wanted to bring up was that maintaining model compatibility across versions is uh, really, really important in a game under active development. Um, so at training time, what we do is we have the simulator actually just like provide a state specification of what objects are you going to be like telling me about? What are the dimensions of the features on those objects? And we use that to actually construct the model and then load checkpoints in such a way to fit those new shapes. So we basically have like make graph surgery a primary concern here. Um, and then when the model saved, when training is finished, we actually save out that state specification along with the model binary. Um, what that means is then at runtime, you can just load that state specification to know how to pad and trim, um, uh, to pad and trim the inputs to fit the model. So this allows for, so this is really nice because it allows like full forward and backwards compatibility. So if I train in a branch X, like I know that I can, um, use that model and branch both X minus one and X plus one. So this means that in particular, we can train as far downstream as possible uh, for the earliest detection of issues. Um, and what also like means that we don't have to play crazy games with 
this model was trained on this branch, but we need to like compile it for this other branch. We just have a model which we train as far downstream as possible and then check in as close to the upstream as possible. Okay, and that's basically it. That's not the like um, a exhaustive list of the kinds of things you need to think about when trying to bring reinforcement learning to actual um, game developments, but I think those are some of the interesting ones that uh, occurred to me. The last bit here will just be a quick note on uh, what the infrastructure sort of looks like uh, to actually run this stuff. So we chose to use Kubernetes to orchestrate the components that constitute a training run. Um, what this means is that we sort of um, have a bunch of pieces that we need to worry about, which is the training server, which actually may be like a message queue and you know consumers off that message queue that uh, do diagnostics and others do training and others are solving auxiliary tasks or whatever. Um, but basically all the pieces of the puzzle are um, listed out in a t as a templated Helm chart, um, which means we can just say, oh, if I want to run an experiment, I just need to provide the configuration and deploy that chart. Um, this ha this means that there is a hard requirement the simulator is available as a container, um, which like may be a problematic for others, but you know it worked for us. Um, and this basically gives us a way to like simultaneously configure a sort of a fairly complex uh, distributed system. Um, and then on top of that, basically we just need then some separate service to be able to configure and launch experiments. Um, this, you know, so you just want to do you know, all the basic ML ops things. You want to be able to track your configurations, organize your training logs, man manage the model lineage of, okay, this model was started from this checkpoint, which has like all of these previous checkpoints. So you know exactly the data that your model actually used. Um, and this is pretty important for that the target push button experience of being able to link this into automation, which brings us to the final uh, slide here. Um, when we think about the full pipeline of what it what this process might look like in the future is basically the idea is to have folks work on content, check that into source control, and then when it's ready for training, like the draft is at a point where we think that you know maybe we should have uh, AI for it, um, is to actually then check in a configuration listing out these are the scenarios um, that should be included in training, um, and then someone has to then press the button, say, okay, build all the relevant artifacts, trigger the training, um, which will then send it over to uh, Airflow or, or Airflow, but you could imagine any sort of scheduler to manage that training lifecycle of like deploying the experiment, making sure nothing explodes, um, and then uh, cleaning up after it's done before triggering a callback job to say, okay, here's the model, um, go ahead and check this one in. Um, the nice thing here is that like it provides a pretty clean break between their build system and um, the machine learning as like the machine learning scheduling aspects of it um, by providing an interface which is simply like defining here are the artifacts needed for training and then here's where you should put the model when you're done. Um, and so basically it's like like it doesn't really complicate um, you know, whatever established patterns they have for C we have for CICD anyways. Um, and it's just a, a pretty simple addition on that. And then all the like the hairy, scary um, reinforcement learning stuff is tucked away um, for folks who are uh, you know, specifically out to, to handle that sort of work. Um, and that's basically it. Um, so I do want to so sort of like look at the this from the sort of wrappings up. The, the biggest challenge is in fact still just getting that initial working model. Um, and this is both in terms of trying to pick the right algorithms and trying to get the hyperparameters to work in the machine learning part, but also trying to figure out, okay, what modifications do I need to make to, um, like what modifications need to be made to the game simulation itself, or like even just getting a standalone simulator um, up and running. Uh, and that entire process of going from the idea of, oh, it would be cool to have a reinforcement learning agent to we have something it's doing, it's not perfect, but it's doing something reasonable um, is like a pretty big leap still. And so on the other side of that, I do think that the biggest opportunity on that front is to try and make reinforcement learning a, a reliable component in that uh, toolkit, which is to say like, if we can sort of you know, specify out what the pattern should be, like what the changes look like, if there are easier tools for uh, plugging in sort of not just like building an environment for research purposes, but 
taking an arbitrary environment and uh, linking it to a reinforcement learning pipeline, uh, that would be, um, you know, that opens up the opportunities for some of the stuff that was talked about yesterday in terms of automated game balance, uh, new forms of automation for creative processes, um, new game modes, new features, uh, more like better experiences, all those things sort of depend on being able to easily do this kind of stuff um, and not having to, uh, like if we can make reinforcement learning a boring option, that would be sort of, that would, that would be great instead of this big, scary uh, machine learning black box. Um, yeah, and so that's basically it. Uh, thanks uh, for your time. And if you have any contact or if you have any you know, interest in what we're doing, please feel free to contact me. Um, my email is there. We do hire interns every summer. Thanks. That's amazing. Thank you so much, Wayne. This was super cool. I always love to hear about the practical challenges and the constraints that people face um, in actually shipping reinforced learning agents in production. Um, also, a quick note to thank everyone in the Q&A uh, for some fantastic questions coming in. Uh, keep them coming. As a reminder, we'll be going through all these questions at the end of the session. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Jacob Forster. Uh, we have his pre-recorded session and he'll be joining us in the Q&A after. I'm very curious to find out more about uh, his latest research in zero shot coordination for multi agent environments. Uh, this is a very, very active area of research. So let's hear from Jacob. My name is Jacob Forster, and I'm extremely excited today to talk to you about zero shot human eye coordination in Hanabi. At the very heart of my research is how we can train multi agent strategies that are compatible with other agents whether those other agents are human, humans in the same environment or artificial intelligence systems. In the last decade, we've seen a lot of progress in the application of AI systems to games. In particular, we've beaten the best human players in Go, in chess, in Dota, and for example, in poker. But these games have something in common. The only goal is for the AI system to beat the human player. And this begs the question, is it really our goal as researchers to make more and more humans miserable by beating them at something that they have practiced their entire lives? And I'd like to argue, no, this is not our goal. Instead, we need to build AI systems that can cooperate, communicate, and coordinate with the humans. And this, this setting, human eye coordination, has unique challenges and opportunities. Let's think about first what actually is human eye coordination. It is by definition, a multi-agent problem where we have the human and the AI agent. Furthermore, it's fully cooperative because the goal of this robot shown on the left-hand side is to help the human on the right-hand side. Furthermore, it's partially observable because commonly there will be things that are not observed by the AI agent. Those might be the human reward function, which is not exactly known, or might be the things that are happening behind the head of this robot because the robot is currently forward facing. And that means we have to deal with partial observability. Lastly, and most importantly though, we can't know the exact strategy that a human is going to play in every possible state. And we can't expect the human to know exactly what we will do in every possible state. And that means we have to coordinate spontaneously with this human. This is formalized in the zero coordination framework that I will introduce in this talk. A crucial skill that allows humans to coordinate in these settings is called theory of mind. So imagine that you're a cyclist and you're cycling down the road in London and you see a person next to a bus stop raise their hand. Immediately, you know that there must be a bus behind you because you can interpret the fact that this person is signaling for a bus to stop and therefore there's a bus behind you. This ability of humans to interpret the actions of others when observing them and to be informative when being observed by others is commonly summarized the theory of mind and is crucial for coordination. I believe that rather than beating users, uh, humans in competitive games, we have to start understanding the fundamental principles of coordination and how they can be used in multi-agent learning systems. Throughout this entire talk, I'll be using the framework of reinforcement learning to make progress on this agenda. In reinforcement learning, we have an agent shown on the right-hand side, 
And we have an environment shown on the right-hand side, and we have an agent shown on the left-hand side. The agent obtains observations O and rewards R from the environment and takes actions U at every time step. Based on this action, the environment transitions to a new state S prime that's drawn from distribution condition on the Markov state S and the action U the agent has taken. The goal of this agent is to maximize through learning the total expected reward J per episode, which is nothing but the discounted sum of rewards in the episode. We'll be using deep neural networks to represent this agent. So there's a function approximator that takes in the observation of the agent and maps into a distribution over actions or an expected return for every given action. Clearly, one agent isn't quite enough. Instead, we have a red, a blue, and a green agent. And in general, they can take in their own observations or their own rewards and take their own actions. What makes the setting complicated is that the future state of the system depends on the actions of all of the agents in the environment rather than just one of them. I will be focusing on fully cooperative settings, or in other words, decentralized partially observable Markov decision processes in this talk or deck from the piece. In these settings, the reward function is shared across all agents. And this means that all agents are maximizing a joint shared team reward. Clearly, this is not poker, it's not chess, and it's not Go. So the question is, what is an appropriate benchmark? And the good news is that there is a fantastic benchmark for studying the ability of coordination and cooperation. And this benchmark is called Hanabi. It's a card game that's fully cooperative. So everyone is working as a team jointly and partially observable. The twist is that in Hanabi, I cannot see my own cards. I'm holding my cards away from myself. So while you can see my cards and I can see yours, you, no one can see their own cards. This means that as a player, I have to interpret the actions of everyone else in my team to figure out which cards can be played and cannot be played. It's entirely focused on theory of mind. It's exactly this theory of mind aspect that makes Hanabi so fascinating to human players and so appropriate to use it as a human AI coordination testbed. Hanabi is essentially a form of cooperative counting where we want to build stacks of cards for each color, starting with a one and ending with a five. So this is a little introduction to Hanabi where we're starting out the game and we can see the hand of our partner. We don't know our own cards. And now the partner spends a hint token to provide a grounded hint to us, which is costly. Now I know that these cards are ones. And without further wondering about it, I know that each one can be played at this moment. So I play one of these cards and it's the red, red one. At the next move, the partner points out a red card in my hand. This does not a priori tell me whether or not this card is playable because it could be the red four and it could be the red five or red three and only the red two is playable. However, I have theory of mind. And that means that I can reason over why my partner decided to tell me this, that this card is red and assign intent. The goal of this game is to play cards. So maybe they were telling me that this card is indeed playable. And if I play this card, I find out this is the red two. I notice that this can be done just based on the rules of the game, humans find those conventions that with the, without requiring prior agreement. This is another move. I spent another hint token. I find out these cards are blue. And indeed, I can ask myself now, maybe this is the blue two that can be played at this point in time. And indeed, Hanavi has been a great test problem for the community to challenge, to, to think about partially observable fully cooperative settings. The issue is that the default problem setting here is self-play. And this means the goal is to train a team of agents that does well when being paired together in that same constellation at test time. And in many settings, the self-play setting is a good idea because for example, in two players or some settings, if I find any Nash equilibrium, I cannot lose a test time. In contrast, in fully cooperative settings, optimal self-play policies can do arbitrarily bad at test time. They will only do well in the exact team of players they were training with. And that's illustrated on this slide. So here you can see the payouts, what happens if we train state-of-the-art self-play policies 11 times over and then pair them in a cross-play team where we train, take the first agent from, uh, from the first run and pair them with the second agent from a different run, for example. And each row here is one of these agents being paired with a different agent. So only the diagonal are the self-play 
evaluations. Everything else is cross-play. And as you can see, the self-play agents have developed highly idiosyncratic conventions where, for example, red or yellow means play the newest card and white or blue means discard the latest card. Those are extremely efficient in self-play, but are very, very different from the human conventions. And they're also mutually incompatible because they use arbitrary codes. And as a result of this, the self-play score is 24 points, over 24 points, but the cross-play score is around three points. Okay, this is a huge failure. We can't expect to coordinate with humans if our independently trained agents can't even coordinate. So we formalize this desiderata in our problem setting called zero-shot coordination, where the goal is to train two independent policies such that they obtain a high score when they're being paired in cross-play through a mixed team. And the coaches can agree on the training strategy beforehand, but the teams can't communicate during training. We partially addressed this setting in our paper called Other Play for Zero Shot Coordination that was published at ICMAN in 2020. Here we formalize this as essentially AI designers that have to construct agents that have to interact in a set of ex ante unknown deck pom DPs, and they're not able to coordinate on each of these deck pom DPs. The question is, what should the learning will be? To illustrate why this is hard, let me show you a very simple coordination problem where you have um, levers that have to be chosen and you're cooperating with a random stranger on the internet. And if you pick the same lever shown on the left-hand side, you get the reward shown next to it. So you get 1.0 points, you get 0.9, 1.0. If you pick a different lever, lever, you don't get any reward at all, it's zero. And crucially, there's a single attempt and this task description, everything you're seeing on the screen is common knowledge. What would you do? Now, the way that I approach this problem is to think about what I would do if I replaced the random stranger with my imaginary twin that goes through exactly the same reasoning steps as me. So first obvious answer is, let's pick one of these arbitrary 1.0 levers. So I pick this lever, my twin picks that lever, and voila, we fail to coordinate. Next option is we both go through the re same reasoning process again, and we pick the 0 0.9 lever. And immediately we have achieved coordination. This idea that you have equivalent but mutually incompatible policies is at the core of our method. And we formalize this through symmetries. Symmetries are mappings that can be applied to the states, the actions and the observations in the deck form DP and leave the entire tree unchanged. Because I can apply them to observation states and actions, I can also apply them to the policies themselves, where this is nothing but a policy that is acting on a, a permutation of the action space and a permutation of the observations. This is quite abstract. So let me make this clear. We have a robot in a simple example that lives in a 2D world of X and Y coordinates and needs to go to some goal in the middle of the room. Now, you might think that it's enough to simply invert the X or Y axis, for example, go from the top right to the bottom right corner as, in, as a symmetry transfer. However, Remember that if you're in the top right corner and you take the green action, you're moving away from the goal. But if you're in the bottom right corner and you move upwards, you're moving towards the goal. So if I invert the Y axis, I also have to permute the action space of this robot, which is why the symmetries act on, act on states, observations, and actions. Now the question is, given that we have those symmetries in the environment, how can we train them? How can we use them to train more human compatible policies? And our answer is other play. So in self-play, we can exactly optimize the expected return J as a function of the joint policy pi. We can optimize pi one and pi two, the two players in the environment. In contrast, in other play, I have to be robust to arbitrary symmetry breaking being carried out in a way that's incompatible with my symmetry breaking. So if I think a policy pi two is a great policy to pick, then I have to be robust to my partner test time thinking that all the possible phi of pi two are equally good. And that's formalized in the other pi objective. And it corresponds to maximizing equivalence classes of policies. So the question is, if you pick pi one and pi two from the same equivalence class IID, what's your expected cross play score? And that's shown in this little proof. And this essentially means that we're gonna be robust to symmetry breaking being done in an incompatible way. And this can be implemented because it's a simple perturbation of the environment that gets done every time step uh, independently. It can be implemented on top of any deep reinforcement learning algorithm. 
Now, what does it look like in a picture is we have two teams again, the Brazilian and Argentinian team, but now each half is played with a permuted form during training and then tested in crossplay. Or if you imagine that these files correspond to inversions or rotations, then during training, we're sampling random permutations. So you can think of this as an asymmetric domain randomization that then results in a more robust team that achieves a higher score at test time. In Hanabi, the symmetries are nothing but the colors of uh, the cards. So there are five colors and these are arbitrary labels. So the game doesn't change if we change, if we reshuffle all the colors. Obviously, I have to do it consistently for the fireworks, the hands, and the action space of the agents. So in other play, the point of view of one agent is that uh, there's a, for example, in this game state, there's a yellow one, and there's a playable yellow two, and I can hint to this card by saying your first card is yellow. Now, under one of the fives that switches yellow and white, the game state instead starts with a yellow five on the first stack, and there's a white one in, in the fireworks, but I can still hint to the playable Y2 now by saying your first card is white. So the semantics of the situation doesn't change, but all the colors have been redone. And obviously this is only done for one agent and it's drawn randomly every time, every episode. So what this does other play is that it allows agents to coordinate reliably on an equivalence class. And in our lever game, the equivalence class, are, all of the 1.0 options are equivalent and the 0 0.9 option is unique. So other play uniquely coordinates on the 0 0.9 option, which gives it a consistent payout of 0 0.9, both during training and then in zero shot testing. In Hanabi, this results in a cross play score that goes from three points for our self play method to around 15 points with a vanilla implementation. And then up to 22 points when we add more auxiliary tasks. And again, here it largely increases the cross play score when we're evaluating agents that haven't been trained together. Now, this is exciting, but I think the much more important point is that as we move towards better zero shot coordination between AI agents, we're also developing agents that are much better at playing with humans without having been exposed to any human data during training. And that's shown in this plot where we have the self play bot on the X axis and the other play bot on the Y axis when they're being paired with human subjects that know the Hanabi game, but had not played with any bots beforehand. And what you can see is that for almost all decks of cards, um, the other play bot obtains a much higher score when being paired with a human than the self play bot. We get around 16 point average for the other, other play bot and five point average for the self play bot. And this says that we've discovered a method that can learn human compatible policies without requiring any human data. So here I think is the first principle of coordination that we have unveiled. Those shall not choose a policy from a set of equivalent but mutually incompatible policies. Obviously, we're not done with this problem because there's a lot of work to do. Um, for example, we have to break apart understanding the problem and solving it. Because in reinforcement learning, while we're exploring the environment, we're also settling on a specific solution. And this is highly problematic in zero shot coordination. Furthermore, we need to be able to adapt on the fly to much broader set of policies, even to policies that we didn't see during training. And this is something that humans can do very easily. They can interpret intent. Um, and this is something that we don't, we, we currently struggle to replicate in our multi-agent uh, reinforcement learning. Ultimately, I think we have to uncover the different principles underlying coordination. I have some idea for this, but a lot more work is, needs to be done. And obviously humans won't be theoretically perfect. They won't exactly follow those principles. So we have to learn from human data what human specific priors are such that we can, for a general new problem setting, produce human-like policies without requiring human data on those policies. In the long term though, while games are fantastic, I like to move away from cards and towards cars. So building simulators that are closer to real world problems where you can test those ideas in a step towards a real world issue. And I'm actually like deploying them in the real world. In the long run, I also think it's good to start addressing the large multi-agent problems that exist in the real world, such as um, climate change, fake news and pandemics. And to summarize my talk, I think we have a huge opportunity here where we can start to fundamentally understand coordination and cooperation in multi-agent settings. Um, we need to develop algorithms that can learn human compatible policies. We have made real algorithmic progress on that journey so far, but we have huge challenges ahead 
In particular, we have to bridge the gap towards real world settings. Um, and one of the potential avenues here is to bring together this research with gaming research that could be a potential stepping stone because obviously when we have uh, computer games and we want to build AI systems that can uh, be playing a team with humans, those are exactly the skills that are needed. And there's a huge amount of exciting work to do. So I'd like to thank you to, for listening and also point out that the code has been open sourced a lot of it at my website. And um, I hope you all stay safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jacob. This was such a great talk with such clear examples. Uh, we have Jacob on the call now, so to unmute yourself, you just need to press the star um, six on your phone and you can join us. Uh, so we have a wonderful set of questions for both our speakers, uh, Wayne and Jacob. Um, thank you so much to everyone who submitted their questions. Uh, we're going to try and take them one by one. So my first question is for Wayne. Um, will you release an academic research paper on this work or at least an in-depth blog? This sounds super cool. We will probably share more information in the future. I, I don't, I you know, can't make any strong promises, but we also think it's super cool. <laughs> <laughs> yep, great to see that uh, people are sharing uh, this as well. Um, my next question now is for Jacob. Um, thank you for presenting this excellent paper. Uh, would you believe uh, there are ways to exploit asymmetries in the environment to create trust systems? For example, an agent would be able to prove its commitment to cooperation instead of defection. I think that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. Um, the challenge is that I'm looking at settings where there is a minimal amount of pre-coordination. So at the opposite of the spectrum, you are exactly looking at settings where you can train an exact team of agents together. And then you may want to have precisely the kind of secret handshakes that my method is trying to avoid. Does that make sense? So I fully agree that um, it is advantageous in a self-play setting to exploit the policies and break them in a unique way that helps us coordinate better as a team or we'll recognize each other as part of the team. But clearly this would fail whenever you're trying to coordinate with an agent that you haven't had prior exposure to during training. And that's been the focus of this work because I think that's something that's been underappreciated by the machine learning and multi-agent community where the focus has largely been on the self-pay setting. But thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer as well. Um, the next question now goes to Wayne. Uh, why not pick ranked players and use imitation learning? Great, so that, that's a great question. I mean, so honestly, if we could get human data, that's like the gold standard is the people who, like the, the system that knows best how to play Hearthstone are the players who play Hearthstone very well. Um, but the problem is the target content that we want to create the AI for is uh, the single player content where there's never a human on the other side. It's always been an AI. Uh, and so that's like, first of all, we don't like, even if we tried to get data for that, we wouldn't have it. And then on top of that, the goal is to be able to do this for unreleased content. So there are no player, there's no player data available at all. And so we want a system that can bootstrap um, as much from scratch as possible. Sounds good. Um, in the interest of time now, moving on back to another question for Jacob. Um, how does the partial observability of Hanabi, where only the cards of other players are observable, translate to the goal of cooperation in settings where only the own cards or knowledge is observable? That's another fantastic question. Thank you. So from a formal point of view, it doesn't actually matter, right? Because at the end of the day, all that matters is that you have partial observability whereby some part of the state space isn't observed to myself, right? So in terms of methods being developed, the methods that work in Hanabi will work in other fully cooperative partial observer settings. What's nice about Hanabi though is that it creates this element of uh, theory of mind focus that's normally not there for other card games because in a fully cooperative setting, if I can observe the most crucial part of the state space, which are my own cards, then the partial observability is already drastically reduced. So Hanabi really puts 
a sharp focus on partial observability in, fo- in, uh, in fully cooperative settings because the most crucial component of the state of the world, which is my own hand, is not observed. So if you want, this is an extreme case of the deck pump DP setting. You can imagine that in other settings where I can see my own cars but can't see my, my teammates' hands, it might be much easier to coordinate because at least I know what to do already without having to rely on theory of mind. Right? So I think this is, you can think of this as being a very extreme case of the deck pump DP setting, and therefore our methods are very general and can be applied to other deck pump DPs. Great answer. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, switching back to Wayne again, uh, could you talk a bit on the state or feature representation of the cards themselves? Uh, how does the model read the card ability? Are you using some sort of NLP or another easier representation? Uh, right. So uh, we are not doing NLP on the the card text itself. So what we do is we treat each individual card as um, we just provide an embedding for each of those cards. Uh, so in some sense, the vocabulary is the set of card IDs, uh, and then we hope that the learning will group similar card text and functionalities together. Um, you could imagine a world in which we use the initial card text to sort of group initializations, but um, certainly don't want to be having to create a model that both knows how to read Hearthstone card text and plays Hearthstone. We just want to think that can uh, skip ahead if possible. Thanks for the answer. I love how we keep on switching from uh, Hearthstone to Hanabi card games and all this uh, challenges. Yeah. Uh, another question for Jacob. Um, in typical human-human cooperation, there is always some kind of communication. Hanabi seems to heavily restrict communication by design. Are there possibilities for communication in Hanabi that do not make the game trivial, but also allow for more natural cooperation? That's another fantastic question. So I think um, what we didn't get across enough in this talk is just how different human communication is from the kind of communication protocols that typical self-play agents would learn. So I actually think that Hanabi provides a great proxy for the communication aspect, how humans have to use it, because we have a grounded communication protocol where we can actually provide grounded hints by saying, this card is blue, this card is red, that's the one, that's the three. And that's very much like humans can use their grounded language. But this communication protocol, like using human language, is associated with cost, with effort. So you have to pay for it. Right? And that's exactly what this is all about. It's about how we can get agents to conform to ground the communication protocols rather than developing arbitrary conventions of themselves that are incompatible with other players at that time. Right? So just to be clear, there is grounded communication in Abbey, which is a, you know, a simple proxy for grounded language. And we try to prevent the agent from utilizing other means of arbitrary non-grounded language that they de- develop themselves during the game, which would be incompatible with humans. And obviously you, can, you, know, you could exchange the grounded channel as it is and make it less costly and that wouldn't make that game trivial, but it would make it easier because there's less theory of mind required the moment that you have more grounded information. Right? And just sort of the, the example I gave for what is non-grounded communication are the self-play policies where suddenly hinting red means that the fifth card should be played. Right? And that's what self-play agents can do. They can agree that any arbitrary action can carry any arbitrary meaning. So if you try to get an agent that can actually talk to a human, but the self-play, they would end up with protocols that wouldn't use the grounded protocol because that typically is costly, but they would just communicate information through arbitrary little motions, which are completely meaningless to humans or other agents at test time. And again, thank you for the question. Great question. Great, thanks for your answers. Um, we have more questions coming up, so I'm gonna switch to another one for Wayne. This is actually two questions in one. So first one. Since the goal is not to produce a superhuman opponent, uh, is the goal to have your AI be as similar to human as possible? And the second, could you put a player against your AI in an online play uh, without your players noticing it? So, um, to the first to the first question, actually, um, it, human as possible is actually not really important either. Uh, it just has to not make obviously bad decisions and provide a reasonable challenge, right? As I said before, the, the target scenarios, and the target environments that um, players are meant to encounter this in um, are just the uh, solo adventures anyways, where 
I mean, it's not even clear what it would mean for some of those to be uh, human-like because many of them have scripted events um, and are like the goal is to actually be as close to that existing system as possible. We just don't want to do the work for it. Um, on the question of like, would people notice? I think that there are definitely tells um, that are that sort of appear because it you know starts a sequence of move like miss sequences are are more frequent. Um, the kinds of errors it makes are sort of human looking, but um, uh, probably you would tell. Thanks for the great question. I know this is always a big problem of human likeness to assess is your agent playing like a human. That's really hard to, to evaluate. Um, another question for Jacob. Um, how could agents trying to cooperate with humans adapt to humans drawing information and strategies from parts of the world outside the game or model? Yeah, so, so this is um... This is a really good question again. Um, I think right now I've been looking at the far end of the spectrum. So if you think about just training a model from human data without using the game, that's one end of the spectrum that has been sort of looked at before. And I'm really interested in understanding the fundamental uh, concepts and principles behind coordination. And that's sort of from like the zero coordination framework where the only shared context is the deck bombing P setting that will be used at test time. And I think the, the crucial thing to realize there's a whole spectrum in between where you have partial access to other common knowledge between the two parties. So you can imagine that we actually augment the common knowledge, not just be the deck point of view, but also to be um, other elements of grounding. So for example, imagine the lever game where instead of having all the same levers, now there is common grounding that some of the levers are different from others. And it's common knowledge that this, these levers exist and they're known to both parties. The, the point I'm trying to make is that I think that approach is complementary. There will be common grounding that exists, be it access to some uh, traces of behavior that we all have or some other norms that we want to uh, exploit and use. But beyond that, there will be situations that are not covered by the prior knowledge of common grounding, where we have to extend into new parts of the state space and extrapolate our coordination strategies. So I think in the long run, what I'd like to understand is first get the principles of coordination right and understand what that part of the spectrum looks like if we only have the deck point appears to come knowledge between the parties and what coordination strategies we can draw from that and then combine this in the longer run with uh, other common knowledge assumptions such as shared access to trajectories which can be used to try and break some of the ties but probably not all of the ties or other biases that come from human gameplay but my goal is always trying to develop relatively general methods that can be generalized to novel deck bomb DPs because ultimately our agents will be facing novel situations in the world and will have to decide how to coordinate on the fly without being able to look up every situation in a, in a database before. But if you assume that you can see every situation at test time and you have human examples for every situation, you don't need to understand the, the fundamental principles of coordination. But I think that's unrealistic. The world is too complex for this. So we have to understand the fundamental working principles behind, behind coordination. Thank you for the question. Thank you again for the great answer. Um, I'm going to move to another quick question for Wayne. Um, how can you create AI players at different skill levels? My intuition is that early stopping and training would not create an effective medium uh, difficulty for an AI. Right, so um, so we actually just have one setting, which is full blast, as you know, as best it can do, but difficulty can be controlled by other mechanisms. So in particular, the contents of the decks, um, the cost of the hero powers, and sort of the game mechanics aspect of like, even if you do as you know well as you can, there's a certain difficulty that can be associated with that. Um, and that's actually in some ways a lot easier to reason about instead of worrying about like, what does it mean to be slightly worse at Hearthstone? Whereas it's a lot easier to think about my deck is not that strong because that's what's something, you know, that's what people do all the time. Sounds great. Um, well, we need to wrap up now. We're approaching the end of our session. Um, thank you so much for participating, everybody. Uh, thank, I would like to thank the speakers for their amazing talks and staying with us for, for Q&A at the end. Our parallel sessions will continue after the break at 10 past the hour. Uh, please choose uh, your own track next. Um, we have uh, two amazing ones to choose from. 
One is on understanding players and the second one on responsible gaming. Um, our producer ha have kindly displayed uh, the slide with different uh, team live links, uh, which you'll get to see in the Q&A chat as well. And thank you so much again and have a great rest of the day or evening uh, at the summit.